Hi everyone. How's everybody doing? Good? Cold? Yes, this room is surprisingly cold, but the good thing is you won't fall asleep. Um, I'll use that to my advantage. So, hi, I'm Philip. Let's see what we can do about auditing, or let's start by talking about security. Because oftentimes security looks something like this, where we say everything is fine, and we don't even know what is on fire, but it, probably something is on fire, and we just accept it. And I would generally put security incidents into three different groups. And they are for your information, what the fuck, and then there is oh my god. These are pretty much the security incident levels that you might run into. And we kind of want to figure out like, where are we and how bad is it going to be? That's kind of the, the general idea that you can have. So going from worst to best cases, what is the worst case how you find out about the security issue? It's normally from the press or from your users that say like, hey, um, you logged in somewhere um, and now all my data is stolen. Um, it might be something that somebody is asking for ransom, like somebody broke in and now is harvesting uh, bitcoins on your AWS instances, which is very inefficient, but since it's your bill, you can still do that. Um, you could see it just on your cloud provider's bill because something has gone wrong. Um, you could figure it out after the fact, and the ideal case is somebody has broken in, but you can prove that nothing bad has happened. And that's kind of what we are trying to do here with the auditing trail. We want to basically see if something has happened. First, we want to find out something has happened. And then we want to also be able to say, like, OK, I can actually prove what the attacker has done and what that means for my systems and my data and everything. And with stuff like GDPR in Europe, it's getting more and more important to actually know what people are doing and what is broken. So obviously, there are no silver bullets. And there's no single tool that anybody can promise you that this will deliver exactly what you need, because this is not how stuff works. This is only what tool providers do. Um, but we'll look into some option of what you could do. So let's start with Audit D. Who is using or has heard of Audit D? Anybody? N not enough. So let's see what we can do about um, Audit D, or what actually Audit D does and what it doesn't do for you. So this is from the man page from Audit D. It's the user space component of the Linux auditing system, and it writes records. So one thing you need to keep in mind is that Audit D doesn't block anything. Audit D is just a silent watcher. It just keeps track of whatever bad stuff is happening. If you want to block an attack, you will need to add additional tools. Audit D is really just for keeping track of what is happening. Um, and the idea is you can monitor file and network accesses, what users are doing, logins, um, any kind of security-related event. That's what Audit D is really trying to do. So it basically just keeps track of all the things happening in your system. And it looks something like this. So you have your um, user's land application that is running, and then it's calling something in the kernel, and then you have these rules. And these basically rules um, define what should be logged. So anything passing through those exclude rules, so you define rules and you basically say, these are the things I'm interested in. And then you basically turn on what is the thing that I want to log, and that will go to the auditing daemon. So basically, you just describe the rules of what you want to get, and those will then be logged. Um, so to give you a quick um, idea of what this looks like, um, I hope that is large enough for everybody to read. Um, so this is what um, you have Audit D has multiple um, things to actually interact with it. So all report is basically giving you an overview of what has been happening on your system. I see some people are fighting to read it. Is that better? OK, good. Um, then let's stick to that resolution. So you can see, see that this was running just a short while today. Um, but it already saw that we had three configuration changes. You can see how many logins in that time happened, how many failed logins. Um, which users, which, how many executables were run, etc. This is obviously all based on events. And you can see the actual events um, by doing a uh, search, and then you add raw, and this is just showing you the raw events. And this is just a long list of events happening. And you can, for example, look at this one here. So this is one event. And an event always starts with a type. And so you can see here, daemon end is some daemon was stopped. Actually, the audit D daemon was stopped. And then you basically have a timestamp, and then you have a process ID. And then you can see the operation was terminate. You can see 
the ID and the process ID, and then you can, for example, see that the, um, that the result was a success. So this was successfully stopped. And then you could see that this one here is the next event. So type was user start, you have another ID. Sometimes these IDs are duplicate if you have multiple rules monitoring something based on a single system call. So you might have duplicate um, timestamps and IDs sometimes. And you can see here um, with sudo, something was called that actually um, the session was opened. And all of these events here we're fetching. What you could do is you could say, um, give me only the successful events, and the syntax is slightly weird, you say success is yes, and then it will give you everything that was successful. You could also check like, were there any unsuccessful or unsuccessful events? Um, in our case, we don't have any. So here you can filter. And well, this is nice and this works on a single machine, but we will need to take this to the next level. But we'll get to that in a moment. If you want to get a better understanding of what these rules look like, um, Red Hat has a very good explanation of what the rules actually look like and how they are broken up. So they have complete examples and they walk you through all the possible parameters basically. So if you want to understand in depth what is the specific event doing, the Red Hat documentation, I have the, those linked in the slides as well, that is a very good starting point to actually go there to see what is happening. Um, what are the actual rules that you can run or should run? And Audit D has a bit of an arcane syntax, and the repository has a couple of rules that you could use. Just to give you an idea, for example, here, this is the right repository in Linux Audit D, Audit D user space. Here are the rules. For example, we could say power abuse. <coughs> and power abuse is something where we say, oh, a user with pseudo privileges is looking into the home directory of an unprivileged user. So they are use, abusing their pseudo privileges to read somebody's private files, for example. Um, if you like that syntax here, that's a bit of a different discussion. But you can see here, we define a filter always on exit. We monitor a folder. If a user in the pseudo group um, watches some files or takes a look at some files of non, the non-pseudo group, then lock that and the key or the tag for this will be power abuse. So this is how this will be locked. And this is how you can actually write all of those rules, which have a weird syntax, but this is what Audit D is actually providing, and you, you will have to use those. Now, the question is, these are some example rules. Should you use those? Maybe not really, because they are just examples of what you could do. Um, there are not that many good examples out there, but one, for example, is this little repository here. They have some they have some binary to actually transform whatever the audit the output is as well, but they do provide um, a couple of good rules. So for example here, they provide a set of rules that somebody is actually using in production that you can take a look at what might be a good solution of what you want to use. So for example here, you can see um, anything um, writing to these folders might be interesting, so you can just here watch these files and then monitor those. Or you could, for example, say like, oh, any network connection I want to monitor. So here, a socket call, a bind command, or a connect, all of those could be locked. The dash K is always the tag or key value pair that you add to that. And then you can see like, give me everything that connected to my system or all the socket calls. So these are all the things that they suggest or try out to run with these rules and that you could monitor. So for example, stuff, you lo load some kernel modules that might be security relevant, you can filter those out or not. So this is one example of the rules. I will actually show you a couple of rules that we use in production for our systems. Um, not a complete list because our InfoSec team wasn't so happy about that, but I got like a good amount of rules that we actually use in production on hundreds if not thousands of servers. Um, I, I have those and we can discuss those then. Okay, so these are some Audit D rules that you can discuss. Something where Audit D is still a bit working on is um, namespace support or Docker support. Um, because right now it's not so easy to see if some specific process is running in a specific process or globally. Um, they have a meta issue and they're basically working their way through that. It's been open for quite a while but it's not done yet. So Docker support is still a bit work in progress in Audit D. Um, so this is working. We collect a lot of events. And now the question is, what do we do with that? Because we have them on one system, but 
that's not going to work. We need to kind of centralize that to see what is going on on multiple systems. Also, if somebody co compromises the system, they could just delete the logs. So you need to ship those off. Um, how do you centralize those logs? Luckily, I work for the company that has one solution for that. Um, there are many others. Um, so yeah, I work for Elastic, the company behind Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana, Beats. We do a lot with logs, including security events nowadays. Um, for those who have never seen our stack, and yeah, we'll run this as a Hello World application. So this is very simple, and we'll only monitor as one single host today. Um, but you get the idea of what you could do with these kind of events. So if you've never seen it, that's the infamous Elk stack, you know, Elasticsearch to store the data, Logstash to get, parse, and reach, and Kibana to visualize. What do I mean when I say parse? Like Logstash just gets data to parse it. What do I mean with parse? Yes, so you have a log line and you have some values in there that are interesting and you want to extract specific things, like you have a timestamp and you might have like a binary and the result and the user and you want to extract all of those things. How do you parse them out of a log line? Regex, yes, or actually we are using grok. Who likes writing regular expressions? That's a surprising number. Um, I always say this is the Stockholm Syndrome. You get so used to writing regular expressions that at some point you start liking it. Or maybe it's job security, that nobody else in your company can read your regex, um, that's why nobody can fire you. Um, so I I'm not too fond of writing regular expressions. I mean, sometimes you don't have a way around that. But we'll see how, how far you can get with regular expressions and what might you make your life easier otherwise. But yes, Grok and regular expressions are kind of the classic way if you have a log line to parse stuff out. Um, if you have a log line or log lines like this, how much fun will you have writing regular expressions for those? And you can see like every single um, type here has different attributes. <coughs> Is this going to be much fun? Probably not. Um, but those who raise their hand, I'll come back to you and we can start writing some regular expressions for those afterwards. Um, if you really want to. Um, we will see how much time we have. I, I might come back to you. Um, so this is one thing. The other thing I said, um, Logstash does parsing and enrichment. What is the enrichment part? Enrichment could be I have some kind of information and I want to add more metadata around it. So maybe I have an IP address and I want to have the geolocation. So the city, the country, the, the point, I can draw it out on a map and something like that or your stuff is running on a cloud provider and you might want to have the instance ID or the availability zone or the region, or you're running in Docker and you want to have the labels of the Docker container or you want to run in Kubernetes and you might want to have the, the node, the pod, the namespace, all of these things. You don't have to collect any of that, but sometimes it's very useful to actually see what is the metadata around it and then be able to filter down on that. And with Elasticsearch, the approach is always that we enrich at ingestion time which is a bit more work upfront, but the big thing afterwards is that search will be very fast. Other systems have more of this approach that you just store what you have right now, and then when you query, then you try to look up stuff, but that will make your queries much slower. We mostly in, like, index and add stuff at ingestion time, and then have faster queries afterwards. Um, the thing is, after some time, we figured out that Logstash is nice, but it's JRuby, and you always need the JVM, and people don't always want to have the JVM on their service, especially if they just want to collect security events. So we added this other component called Beats. There is no B in Elk, so we try to call it Elk, B or Belk. You can see something like this. You can see it's, it's a B, it's an Elk, it's the perfect combination of things. But since already this talk was called scaling, this is not very scalable in terms of marketing. What happens if we add another component? then we'll need to add another letter and it will not be easier to make up another animal. So we kind of got rid of that thing. I, I have stickers back there of the elk, bee or belk, uh, but generally we just try to call it elastic stack now and yeah, we might have to add some colored squares there, but if we add more components, we don't have to read or change the name all the time. And people are always confused when you change the name. So elastic stack is what we try to call it now, but if you call it elk or belk, we will still understand. And it's the same thing, it's just a bit extended. Ah yeah. You have the full combination, very good. Um, and it looks something like this. So you have Beats, which is like a lightweight agent or shipper. 
written in Go, so you have native binaries and that can forward information, either to logstash for parsing or directly to Elasticsearch, and then Kibana can visualize that. And beats have multiple beats, so we have file beat for log files. I always say it's a bit like tail F, but over the network and on steroids, so it can just forward your log files. And we'll look at another beat in a moment, but let's stick to file beat. So, file beat is basically tailing log files, and that's what it does. And we have written an audit D module that basically parses whatever happens in audit D. So, let me just quickly show you what we have there. Um, you want to see the configuration? Who likes YAML? Okay, you've come to the right talk. Um, we, we can do lots of YAML. Um, so, what we have here um, in FileBeat, so FileBeat is tailing a file. And what I'm doing here, basically, I'm just saying, hey, I have Audit D running, I have some other Nginx and system logs I also want to collect, but auditing is the one we want to focus on. Because what you, you needed to do before was basically, you, you would need to tell Logstash, for example, this is the log file I want, this is how it looks like, this is the regular expression to parse it, and then you could store it and centralize it. And after some time, we figured out that a lot of people were doing that for the same things over and over again. Like, lots of people want to get the system logs, or the auditing logs, or Nginx. And we basically wrap that as a module in FileBeat. So basically, FileBeat will know on my operating system, so I'm using Ubuntu 18.04, the audit D logs are in var log and then multiple files there. And it will know that by default, they have a specific format. And then it will provide the regular expression for that. So I'm sorry for those liking writing regular expressions, but you don't have to anymore because we can take care of that automatically, basically. So this does everything automatically here. So this will collect these log files, it will parse them, store them, and even provide the right dashboards. And you can see, for example, here I'm adding some metadata around those about my cloud provider and the, the operating system, and then I basically forward that to Elasticsearch and just store that there, and I'm done. So showing you um, what this looks like. If you've never seen Kibana, this is Kibana. If your Kibana looks different, you have an older version. This is version seven. Um, we have been tweaking colors a lot. Like um, this one is more or less white in seven. Um, six was more blue, five was very colorful. Before it was black, and before that it was white. So basically, based on the color scheme, you can know in which generation you are. Um, right now, we are back to pretty white again. So if you want to look at events, um, so for example here, um, we'll get to the auditing events in a moment. Um, let me switch over to FileBeat first. So FileBeat is collecting various pieces of information on my system here. So this is the classic log file approach. So for example, you can see in the last 15 minutes, um, we had 518 events that we have collected, and I could just look at one randomly. <coughs> And you could see, for example, here, this is from the event module Nginx. So this is actually an Nginx module that we have collected. And you can see somebody ran a get against here, the access log. You can see an offset. You can see the, from where it was coming. So this is, for example, the enrichment that I was talking about. You could see like this was where the, the request was coming from. And this is actually from Ireland. So we've enriched all of that. And you could see which URL was requested um, and what user agent was used, et cetera. Um, we also have some other information here. For example, host, this one here, this host information, um, this is basically this one here. This is some enrichment. So basically the beat can add, when it stores an event, where is this running on? And you can see, okay, this is running an Ubuntu 18.04. For example, if you know you have some security problem just on one specific operating system or one specific version of an operating system, you could just filter down on that. Since I only have that one instance or that one uh, base image here, they will all have the same, but you could, for example, say like here, I just want to have everything that is Ubuntu 18.04.3 because I know this one has security issues. And then you could see like this is the filter now here, and then only stuff for this specific version of Ubuntu would be shown. And we have the same thing for cloud providers, for example. So here, this would be the enrichment for our cloud provider. So you can see this is the instance ID where this is running on. And you could figure out, oh, there's a problem on one specific instance that somebody hacked. Or you could see, oh, one availability zone is down. Or, oh, this is a base image that has a security issue, so I should patch everything with that security, uh, with that base image. So all of that enrichment, it's not necessary and it's totally optional, but it can add value to actually make your logs richer and make filtering easier in the long run. So this is what you can add. 
So this is what we're adding here. Um, by the way, for those who like tail, this view is not very tail-like, but there is another view um, that is much more like tail. We call it the logs UI. So here, you just see, and I can live stream any event. So this will just live stream any event, and you can see it's pretty much like tail F, but you can still filter on stuff here. So for example, I can say event.module, um, that is the one we had before, equals. Luckily, this auto-completes everything for you, so you don't have to remember. Um, for example, I'm only interested <coughs> sorry, uh, in the audit D module, and then you can just run the filter on that, and now you just see the auditing events. And you could add another filter, for example, with end, um, to just have that from a specific host, or a specific cloud provider, or base image, or whatever you have. And here you can already see, this is one of the events we have collected, you can extract or expand that, to actually see um, the messages, what I've shown, sh what I'm showing here, um, and then you have various other pieces of information around that as well that we don't show in this view. But here you can basically see what is happening from an auditing perspective on my host, and we're just collecting all of those. Um, so that's nice, and that works. Um, you can even put that into a dashboard. So let's see the default dashboards. And I'm lazy, by the way. I didn't build those dashboards myself. Those come pre-built, so you can just reuse them. So if you go for file beat audit D, there is one dashboard that just shows you what happened, for example, in the last 15 minutes. Um, or we could actually say like, oh, I'm interested in the last one hour, or maybe we could even say the last two hours. Let's switch it to two hours. And here you can see basically what has been happening. Here you see this, you rem remember in the audit D log, the type event? These are the type events, basically. So this is this group, and you could filter down on, for example, just SSH login attempts. And you can see which, um, golf life, okay. <laughs> um, no, this, these are, uh, for example, SSH login attempts. So somebody is a golf player, obviously, and tries to log into my instance. Um, and you can see um, which events were successful and unsuccessful, and you could zoom out of here, and then actually see where the requests are coming from. And I'm actually surprised that Normally it's China or sometimes it's Russia where a lot of requests are coming from, but today um, it's somewhere else. Interesting. And then you could just see um, what, what logins we have found here and what is working and what is not working. Um, so that is all nice and that works, but it's still very heavily based on regular expressions. And well, we like to dog food and use our own stuff for I think the French always say they like to drink their own champagne because that's a much nicer term than dog fooding. Um, but we have that need because we have our own cloud service where we run Elasticsearch and Kibana as a service. And the colleagues were very interested in having security events because, well, you run a cloud service and security is a big issue because you have lots of data. And they tried to use that, but writing a like regular expression for Audit D was kind of painful in the long run. And they didn't want to write so many regular expressions. Um, so what they did was basically they created a beat. This one is called audit beat, and it basically wraps what the Linux auditing framework is providing and just has that in a structured format because the auditing framework has everything structured. Then it writes it out to a log line, and then we try to parse it back, which is kind of unnecessary because you have it structured in the first place and then you write it back. By the way, this is the same thing if you have any application logs and you write out the log line, and then you need to parse the log line back, especially with the stack trace and everything, maybe you shouldn't do that. Maybe you should uh, store your logs in a structured format right away, and then you can skip all the parsing, unless you write, like writing regular expressions. Um, then you can keep doing that. So what the audit module does is basically it can correlate events directly and resolve user IDs to the usernames, because with audit D, in general, you just have the ID of the user and you always need to figure out which actual user is that. Um, obviously, it can send stuff directly to Elasticsearch. Um, it's potentially easier to configure and it's written in Go, so it's maybe easier to manage as well. eBPF powers on all the kernels. Audit Beat is based on Audit D and not eBPF. eBPF is the extended ba uh, Berkeley packet filter, which is another way to actually filter security events and general events, but it requires more recent kernels. And we ourselves and also many of our users have re rather old kernels, so that's why we are sticking to Audit D because that has been around for a long time. 
So we're skipping that part. Um, with, so we're not doing eBPF, but it's kind of similar capabilities. That's the general idea. And it has full Docker support. So we basically can, every event, we can correlate with Docker. How do we actually get the Docker metadata? So for example, if you run this in a Dockerized environment, we, could, we would know what is the base image and what is the version and what are the labels. Um, all of that metadata would be available. Where can you actually get that information when you enrich the logs? What you need to do is you need to give AuditBeat access to the Docker socket, read only of course, because then it basically knows this is the ID of the Docker um, log or Docker event that I have, and then it uses the ID against the Docker um, socket to actually get the metadata. And this is what we are always doing. Basically, you need some way to actually fetch that information and then we cache that. So we know, okay, this is the ID, then we go to the Docker socket, get all the metadata, and then we enrich all the events with that information. How are we doing that with the cloud provider, by the way? For example, if you run on AWS, how do you get, how was I getting that metadata in Kibana where I had, like, this is the instance ID and this is the base image and everything. Does anybody know where you can get that information from? Yes. So there is this um, special IP address that AWS, for example, is providing, and I think the others have similar approaches. I think it's 169.254, 169.254. If you curl that, or if you query that with a GET request, it will actually give you back the information for the instance itself. And basically, what all our beats can do is, you query that once, you cache the result, and then we enrich all the events with that. So it's not an, another lookup for every single time you run that, but it's a one-time lookup that we cache, and then we can enrich all the events with that. Okay, how do we do that? We basically have a Go library, bless you, um, that wraps audit D. So this is just an open source library that we provide that wraps it, and then audit beat is basically just using this base library to actually get the events. So let's see what we have here. Um, since I was saying, if you like YAML, um, today is your day. Um, let's see what we have in YAML here. So this is the configuration for audit beat modules. You can see this is the audit D module. And here do you do something like resolve IDs. This is, for example, I have a user ID and I actually want to enrich or add the user names. So you can see this is root and this is my own stupid user and whatever. Um, I want to log if audit beat fails. I want to limit my events to <coughs> 8,000 8, events, which should be approximately 17 megabytes of RAM in the worst case. I don't have any rate limiting. For example, you could say I only want to collect 10 events a second, not to overload any system. You could rate limit that. Um, I just throw away like raw information to keep it simple. Back pressure basically means if my queue is full, the kernel will throw away messages directly. And then you can define rules. And defining rules is actually interesting. So you have file watches, that was the dash W, and then you have audit events where you have an action and a filter. So for example, you have uh, success and on exit, you want to filter something out. How do you figure out the system calls? The system calls are actually, um, in a header file in your operating system. So this is where on my operating system the right headers live because this is a 64-bit instance. So what you can do here is um, you can just say, I want to look at all the potential headers. And this one here, for example, this is a write operation. So this is a system call for a write operation on my Linux system. And then you can just say like, these are all the ones that I want to monitor. So for example, you could say I want to have exec and we want to look at this one here so we execute something and you could see for example um, we have another one yes this one here or you can see hey a process was forked or a process was cloned or a socket was fetched all of these are system calls and all of those you could monitor and this is where to find actually the system calls and there are a lot of them but this is just basic Linux stuff figure out where the system calls live. Okay, so what I then do is, um, here I have some rules that I defined on my own. So for example, here I define a rule that whenever somebody reads etc pass wd and is in one specific user group, then I will read that and say like, this is coming from this specific group. Or this was the admin example where the admin was using a user's home directory to read that. Um, this is that example. And down here, 
these are all on GitHub. You can figure out or look at the rules later on. Here, these are the rules actually, or at least some of them that I can share that we are using in production on our cloud service. And we have that running on thousands of instances. So these are the actual rules that they use. For example, here they say, all our systems are 64-bit. If something has calls a 32-bit API, it's probably somebody trying to, like this shouldn't happen. It's somebody trying to exploit some uh, hole in the 32-bit API. And you can just lock those and those might be security relevant. Or we just want to know what is executed on our systems. You can also monitor, this I think is disabled by default and you can just enable it if you need it because this is everything network related. So if you accept the connection, connection if you bind, if you connect or if you listen, all of those will be uh, monitored. You can see any identity changes, um, time changes, user groups, all of these events are being locked or for example any failed or successful logins are being collected here. So this is what we are collecting on those. Let's head over to audit B to see some actual rules. I can throw away that filter. So let's go to audit beat. And you can see now we'll see what, we, what has been happening in the last two hours. Um, so here I actually created my demo instance. You can see in that time frame we can have um, 37,000 um, security events. And if you open one of them, you can see, okay, here we have um, something with a net link. So here that was actually a bind system call that was being collected. Um, and you can so see which user, um, the root user, was using metric beat to bind to an interface. So you can collect all of those. And then you could, for example, say, okay, I want to see everything that was binding. Um, so let's say I want to filter down on bind here. And then you have audit summary how, and I have a very hard time seeing which one, this one it is. Um, and here you can see which binaries were most using uh, the bind commands to bind actually to an interface. And you can see heartbeat, this is basically availability monitoring, um, file beat, metric beat, and packet beat. Those are all running and binding to interfaces. And then there was SSHD. And you could then just say visualize, and you can get the visualization and a quick idea of what is actually binding. These are all the processes that are binding or opening network connections or binding to an inter interface on your host. And then you could just figure out like, oh, this one here shouldn't be happening, for example. Nginx shouldn't be running on my host. And then you can just see what is even act, um, binding and being available on the network on your system to filter those out and actually see if that is what you want or not. Okay, so using Audit D, obviously there are some pre-built dashboards. Let me show you some of those. So there are quite a few actually. Going to Audit B, um, you can get an overview of what is happening on that system. <coughs> so for example, here you can see what kind of events have we collected, when did we collect, how many events, uh, how they were split up, and then you could, for example, see um, these are the actual events that we have been collecting down here. Um, by the way, something that might also be interesting is, this is another, another, another thing that you would be interested in, for example, is SSH login attempts. Who is monitoring their SSH login attempts? Okay, that's not many. Maybe you should. Let's see if I should. Let's see what people are trying. Um, by the way, this is an online instance, so if anybody feels like it, it's Xera WTF because, well, this is my Twitter handle and everything, and WTF is the right thing for any demo. So this is a live instance. You can just query that instance and do failed SSH login attempts and everything, and we would see those. So if you feel like that, you can see here in the last 15 minutes, or actually say, let's say the last hour, you could say how many invalid and failed login attempts we had, and we had a couple, how many were successful, and where were they coming from. And you can also see like the usernames that people um, were using. So for example, if I zoom out, and now you can see now China is back in business. Uh, so most of the failed login attempts were coming from China here. And this is exactly the GOIP lookup. And now I'm super curious, what golf life is and from where that is coming from. So you can just click on that one. It will filter on the username golf life. You can see here we had two attempts. And now I would be curious um, who was that and where were they coming from? Because I haven't seen that one before. Okay, somebody in China seems to like golf in Beijing. 
And I have no explanation. So for, so for example, what you often will see is Raspberry Pi logins or some um, software that is widely used like Postgres or, or various other things. But Golf Life I've never seen. So your SSH login attempts are often like interesting things that people are trying out and that's going well or not so well on your system. So you can monitor those. Okay, so let's look at one of the rules that I have defined here. So for example, the power abuse, that's an easy one that we could just um, take a look at. So um, the tag that we have is called power abuse and my root user is tr looking into the home directory of a user. So let's do that. So let's say I want to look into home and you can see, okay, we have an elastic user. Um, since I'm an admin, I'm interested in that one. Uh, elastic user. And then we have a secrets.txt file here. This is very convenient because now we are very curious and we want to see that. Um, home elastic user secrets.txt. Will this work? Hopefully not because it's missing sudo. So this is telling me, well, this is denied. Um, you can just run this with sudo and then you can see the actual text is my secret. So <coughs> we've seen the secret. Now we actually want to figure out that somebody has abused their privileges. So the rule was um, this one here. So here, home directory and power abuse is the tag that we are looking for. So here in audit D, we then say tags is or equals. And then I think the one we want is power abuse. Luckily, everything autocompletes here. And then we see out of 18,000 events or so, suddenly we only have five. Like here we have one, that was just me right now doing that. And then you can actually look at the raw event and then you can see, okay, we had an audit D rule that fired and it was successful. And you can see the file owner was elastic user and somebody accessed this specific file for that user. And you can also see who it was. So you can see they used cat to actually see the binary. Um, this is the rules, like these are the tags, how we lock that. And you can see it was the Ubuntu user using root privileges to actually see that. And this ties back into what I said in the beginning, when somebody breaks into your system and you want to be able to tell what have they actually done and what information did they get. And with that, you can actually figure out exactly what things have people been doing on your system if you lock the right stuff. Um, so that will make it very handy to actually prove afterwards what has happened on your system. So you can use those. There are lots of other rules that we could use those, but let's keep them for the sake of keeping things simple. Um, yeah, we have 20 minutes left. Maybe we'll return to one or two rules at the end if we have time, but let's see. Um, we also add another thing to make configuration a bit simpler. Like for host, process, socket, and user information, we wanted to have a simpler syntax to actually have that because I still have trouble writing audit D rules and I always find them a bit complicated. So what we have added here is, that is this section. This is not part of system D, this is just implemented in audit D. And basically you say, these are the things I want to collect. So for example, you can see, I want to collect every two seconds, I want to check which processes are running and which sockets are open. And every minute I check who is logged in, which packages are installed, what users are on the system and what is the host information. So all of that can just be collected with that information. You just say like, how frequently do I want to collect that? Just give me the relevant information and I don't care about the rest. So to see those, luckily we have some nice dashboards. Um, let me leave that one. Did you want to take a picture of the configuration? No, okay. Oh, did beat. Yeah, if, I, if I'm too quick and you wanted to take a picture of something, I will publish the slides afterwards so you have everything, but feel free to say like, I want to take a picture of this. So what you want to have is, um, you have, for example, the, the system logins where you could see like who is logging into my system. And this is in the last hour. Actually, we have 87 login attempts and whatever people have been trying. So here you can see what people were doing. And is, maybe you is somebody of you now we, could, we can later on filter on all the Russian login attempts and see what your usernames are. Um, you could, for example, also see um, the packages. I hope I have filled those, maybe the last. Let's see if I have information on that one here. Yes. So here, okay, 
based on the, the scale of my screen, this is a bit hard to read, um, but we can make this full screen. So we have 1,236 1, packages installed on my host. Um, and then you can see this is the operating system and the version. And then down here, you have installed. And then you have for every single package, you basically have what binary is there and uh, what version do you have. So here, for example, um, we have this package and you see the version. And then if you know, okay, there is a security issue for this specific version of a binary, you can actually just search on where is that installed on all my systems. And then you know what is patched or what do you still need to patch. And you just can do risk management on packages. And these are all the things we can do. You could also watch like which processes you have running, which sockets are open, um, and all of that stuff. This is nice, but there is more. So something you might also be interested in is somebody, or you're running a website. Let's do it like this. So if you go to Xera WTF, it, it says welcome. This is the default Nginx install, uh, website. But to keep it simple, um, We'll just use that, and then we'll change this. Uh, no, var www, uh, what was the folder? Index HTML. This is the one we want. So this is the one. And now let's assume somebody um, breaks into your website, and you had a professional website, and suddenly it's not so professional anymore. And now your users go to your website, and they see this, and maybe they're not so happy. And it would be very convenient to actually figure out what was changed and when was it changed. So we have another module to do that. And the module basically is called file integrity. And what you can do is you can say, like, this is the file or folder I want to monitor. And what it does is it will, when it starts up, it will take all the files, it hashes them. And whenever you change a file, it will hash, the, hash them again and check, did the files change? And then it can say, hey, I saw there was a change in this specific file at this point in time. And then you can just monitor those. Um, you could exclude, like, what is this rule here doing? Yeah, this is exactly the VI. The VI has this weird pattern of, re of creating and moving files. And this is excluding the temporary files. I'm also excluding any Git information <coughs> or any temporary files here. So basically, you can say, I want to monitor this, but I want to exclude these files. I want to scan up to 50 megabytes a uh, second so not to overload the system. I want to only hash files that are up to 100 megabytes because otherwise the hashing might be very expensive. You can even pick the hashing algorithm and you go recursive into folders. So this is what you can configure here. Um, by the way, just pointing two things out first. Depending on your operating system, so Audit D obviously only works on Linux because you need the Linux kernel for auditing events. Checking the changes on the file system works for different operating systems, but it has different modules or different APIs in the background using those. So these are the APIs we're using to actually check for file system changes. And then we have a bunch of um, hashing algorithms that you can use, so SHA-1 is the default. If you want to have the most performant one, um, the most performant one is this one here, the last one in the list, XXH64. Um, so if you're concerned about speed, use this one, this is the fastest one that we have implemented here. And what this does is, so if somebody changed our website, and now I want to see what actually happened on my website. Um, so we have file integrity. <coughs> with this thing here, and you can see in the last 24 hours, which files were changed. And you can see we have six initial, when in the initial scan, and one moved. And you can see this one here right now, this was when I moved the file. Why was it moved? Because VI has this weird pattern of actually creating a temporary file and then moving it to the original place. Um, let me actually do um, just the last 15 minutes. Um, and then you can see, okay, this is one file that moved. You can see it is owned by root and the group is moved as well. And you can see this is the file that actually changed. Um, this is the permission. And then you could feel, figure out like this was the actual event. And you can see on this host, one file was changed. Um, and here you could see, okay, the file integrity module um, on this specific inode for this file and that size. And you can see the hashes so you can figure out what changed when and where. And now you know why somebody or when somebody changed our professional website or an important configuration file at what point in time. So that's also easy. Um, one other thing that you might be interested in is Sometimes people open 
network stuff and you want to monitor the network stuff. Um, so for example, here I could just say uh, netcat listen on port 1025 and I'm listening and if anybody wants to chat with me, you can also do that. Um, so here I can just say telnet um, xera wtf port 1025. This should connect and then I can say hello Philip. And then you can see here is coming out again. So if you have a telnet client, you can just start chatting to me and to see, okay, you open a socket and stuff was starting to flow around. So you might want to keep track of stuff like that. So let's see what actually is running on our system. Um, so let's have this one here. So we have the socket is the one you want. So in the last two hours, what has been happening on my sockets, like here, there, there will be a larger number in front that is cut, cut off right now. But for example, you can see here, these are the ports and how many times they were used. So you, this was 53 and various ports. And for example, you can see here, 1025 in the last two hours had three connection attempts. Um, and I could just filter down on that one. So you can see now I have destination port 1025 because I was suspicious and I want to see what is actually happening here. And you can see this is what is going on. So you can see actually a lot of stuff. You can see, for example, okay, a socket was opened. Um, you can also see um, what binary was used. So here you can see this is the process name. So we're using bin netcat to actually open the binary. You can also see what was the actual command that people ran here. And you could even see like which user is doing that. So you can see that the user Ubuntu is doing that. And maybe that is suspicious and you want to figure out what the user Ubuntu is up to. So this is all the stuff that you can do here. Okay, so we've seen those. So who's using Kubernetes? Okay, if you want to run this on Kubernetes, um, you, can, you can, where do you put it? Audit beat should run as a daemon set. So you have a daemon set, which basically means there's one instance running on every host, and then you can collect all the auditing events from all the other containers. And we know the namespaces and the pods and everything, so we can correctly attribute that. Um, the configuration is also out there for that one. It's a bit hidden, it's in the beats repository, and it actually just shows you how to configure that. So let me quickly show you that. Um, so here, here in beats, deploy Kubernetes, and then for the various beats, you have the configurations. The two files that will be most interesting for you is first off the daemon set. So this makes sure you have one instance running on every single host. And basically you say here, this is the image version that you want to run and this is where Elasticsearch then, these are just parameters you pass into it. So basically this is just the Kubernetes YAML to run that. And, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, uh, and the config map, you can then show, first off, this is the configuration. You can see here we get, for example, if it's running on a cloud provider, we add the metadata. And then here we have specific rules for Kubernetes. So for example, we are mounting the host file system and then we are, we are also monitoring what is happening on the host file system here through Kubernetes. Um, so that is also doing what you want for Kubernetes here. Um, one thing that, yeah, you can add the Docker and Kubernetes metadata to that and then you will have all the, the labels from there. Um, there's also Kubernetes audit logs which is kind of similar, but kind of different as well. So what this does is basically um, you have this API here and you can say like, I want to monitor like the pods, like all the requests and responses to my pods and the metadata for pods log and pod status. And then you can write those out to a log file. And well, you know, our stack can work well with log files. So you can then just collect that. So all the auditing from Kubernetes itself, you can collect and uh, get here. This is what you run on the API server. So the uh, API server is just logging all the API calls it gets. You log that to a file, you put it into the stack and you have those included as well. And that's how you include everything with Kubernetes there. So one thing we have recently also added is SIEM, uh, security information and event management. Who is using a SIEM? One, okay. So SIEM is basically, it's a fancier UI. So it's building on top of all the information we have collected. It's just a new um, API UI. So it's just Kibana basically to show you what is happening on your system. So here um, you have an overview. You can see these are in the last 24 hours. These are all the audit beat events that we have collected. Um, 
And you can see, oh, we, we got some network information and we got some log files, and this is all everything we have collected. We can also tie into other things. For example, if you use Cisco devices or you have NetFlow information from your network, um, all of that could be combined and aggregated here. And these are all the sources that you have. And then you just have a nicer view of what is going on in your systems. So for example, here, this is just a curated view of, you can see, how many successful user authentications we had and how many failed ones. I guess somebody is now running a script to, to do failed logins here. Because normally, I don't have that many failed login attempts. But we can have a look at that as well. Um, you can also see like from which source IP addresses those are coming from. And we have a single host here. For example, you could click into the host. And then you would see all the network inf information from this one here. So this is all the metadata, basically, that we have aggregated together. And then you could see, for example, this is the users people try to um, authenticate. So is this you? OK. Well, we found you. Um, and this is, by the way, pretty cool here. This is a new UI where you can all drag and drop. So let me scale it a bit over. So let's see what you have been up to. Um, so I can just drop this user here. And then it shows me all the requests that you have been doing. So I can see um, this is the user session. Um, on, this is the host. And I can see this is the binary you were targeting. And for example, if you compromise a binary, I could just drag that binary up here and filter for that binary as well. Um, and for example, I could add a comment here for my colleagues and say like, OK, I know this user. No problem. I hope no problem. Um, and then you can just add that note, and it will store it. So you can communicate with your security colleagues um, and say like, oh, I've looked at these suspicious events, and this is how to store them. Or we, we pin a specific event, and then we we have that, and the, my colleagues could actually see that and see that I've, I've looked at this. Um, you can uh, open the actual event and see everything that is in here, so then you have the raw information, basically. Um, and you can see what happened, where, when, on what cloud instance. Okay, the user tried to log in. Um, it was a, a failure. And you could, for example, say, oh, I just want the failures, or I want to have the successful events. Like, was this user also pos able to, to successfully log in? Um, you could filter then on that. So right now, we'll just go for the failure. Um, but I could edit that one, and then I could say, I think the alternative is success, I hope. And then you can see, OK, the user had failures, but he wasn't able to actually break in and have a successful login attempt. Um, so you can filter down on stuff like that and just explore your data. Um, OK. So we've seen that. And one thing that is important is all of that UI convention is basically based on one naming schema that we have. And we call it the Elastic Common Schema. Um, what it basically look, looks like is we have defined, like, you have a field called timestamp, and this is what it means. And we have a full definition of what different fields we have and how they look like. So this is, for example, this is the, the schema definition. And then we have here, for example, in base, we know this is a timestamp when an event happened. And this is a specific tag. Um, and how it looks like. So this is just a convention of how to name things, and then our UI can basically use that information, and there is some semantic meaning to that. OK. We've seen that. We've seen that. We've seen that. Scale. If you want to scale, generally what you want to have is you want to have a multi-tiered architecture. You, so normally what we call that is hot, warm, cold. And hot is like the data that you write today. And warm might be yesterday to a week ago. And cold might be like older than a week. Like this is like past events. But if you figure out after three weeks something bad happened, you still want to be able to search that. And with that multi-tiered architecture, you would have fast uh, nodes and SSDs for hot data. And for example, for cold data, you might have spinning disks just to keep more data there and keep it cheaper. Um, there's something we call index lifecycle management, which can do that. And it basically moves data between different nodes and then does operations to keep your data manageable. And it does something, for example, you can say, like, delete action. And you can say, like, after 30 days, I want to delete my data. These are all the actions that you can run on that, basically, to clean up your data and make it easier to run larger data sets. Um, and final note, we have recently acquired another company called Endpoint, uh, or sorry, Endgame. And it does endpoint security. So all I've shown you today was just monitoring what is going on. 
What this software will be doing is it will actually protect your endpoint. So you can run it on servers, but also laptops, and it will actually block things that we know that are bad. And that's something we're just integrating right now, so that's kind of like something for the future. Okay, we can skip the machine learning that is basically anomaly detection. So for example, you could say like, oh, SSH login attempts, and here we had suddenly fewer SSH login attempts, something weird must have happened. Maybe somebody ran a denial of service attack and that's why nobody could SSH into it, our service anymore. So this just learns over time what is happening and then alerts you. However, this is one of the commercial features that we have. This is how my salary is being paid. Um, to wrap up, I always compare this a bit to Lego. Like you have all these building blocks, but you need to put the right blocks on top of each other and assemble them the right way. So they make sense. Um, we've looked at Audit D itself, then Audit Beat, and then how you scale, Kubernetes, Seam, and all the things on top of it. But in the end, it's all based on Audit D and Audit Beat capabilities to get the information, and we just added nicer frameworks and UIs around that. If you want to try out the code, like there are the rules that we are using and everything. This just spins up a cloud instance um, and installs everything, and you can try that out. So there you <coughs> can get all the configs and everything. There are similar solutions from others who also want to work with Audit D. Um, so Orshape, for example, can export to XML. Anybody wants to ex export to XML data rather than JSON? If you have the need, then use Orshape. Slack has something similar that's also putting Audit D information into a more structured format. Okay, that was it. I think we have like two minutes left for questions, if there are any. Thank you. Oh. Normally, I try to take a picture with you um, so I can prove to my colleagues that I've been working. Because, you know, we're, we're a fully distributed company, so nobody knows where I am. Wave, yes, wave, please. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, you have the questions, right? I do. I definitely do, but we probably... If I... We can go to the discussion zone yeah. if you have more afterwards. Well, uh, the fact is that we are now have just one minute, and uh, this means that I will probably just ask one question. And uh, let me ask this one. Uh, Canadian, every, everyone is mad about it. So uh, how Canadian events passed into the pod in your case? Are they HTTP request, or we only or we need a web server in the port to listen. So to be honest, I have never seen that used with Knative yet. I mean, the the API calls, the general logging that will still work because it's just like Kubernetes API calls for for Knative. You can still monitor just what the containers are doing. Still, in the end, it's all coming down to containers, and we just monitor the containers. So I think this will just work the regular way. Like you run audit beat, as a demon said, it will just collect whatever those are doing. So if they open a socket, you can get that. If they access a specific file, you can get that. If they execute some binary, you can also get that. So I think the beauty of all of this is, in the end, it's all a container, and since we can monitor the container, it should be all the same. But if you do that, Please write a blog post because I would be very interested to see that in action because I have never seen Knative and Audit Beat combined yet. Thank you, Philip. Thank you very much.